We're going to uh, change up the agenda a little bit. Uh, Marie Shams is going to go next. He's going to talk about um, access aneurysms and infection. So morning, everybody. Everybody got their coffee? Right. So we're going to go a little out of order. I think Linda's going to talk about m creating dialysis access, and then we're going to talk about complications. But given that the complications are all that we really worry about fixing, uh, we'll talk about that first. Uh, so, you know, as much as everyone sort of delegates the dialysis access case to the uh, intern or send the visiting medical student or send the general surgery resident, uh, then you get done and you realize, crap, these are harder than I thought. And then you're, you know, struggling to figure out um, what to do with these things. I know if you're certainly here at Methodist, there's a human, you know, what, 20 fistulas a day being you know, addressed, and, or you go to some practices where there's tons of it, but I know there's a lot of vascular programs where a transplant does the dialysis access, or it gets done elsewhere. A lot of community vascular surgeons, like, that's what they do. So I think it's important to focus a little bit on it and actually go spend some time with the experts at your, at your training program so you do learn how to manage the difficult access patient. Uh, that's me, that's my conflicts, and again, uh, I, said, I was just talking to Alan Lumsden about this. So the advantage of this course is that we kind of recycle a bunch of talks, and sometimes they're talks that we've given ourselves, like this one, or that we've modified, but this sort of builds a curriculum, and every year the, the, the slides get updated, uh, and so you probably should just go back and use this as your education, because there's not really any reason to reinvent the wheel. Um, so again, why do people get dialysis infections? Uh, um, and then what, so what's the big deal? So a ton of people die because of dialysis graft infections, dialysis fistula infections. And the infection leads to thrombosis and, and failure, and then you gotta do another fistula, and these aren't the healthiest patients to deal with, right? So you got sick patients who end up coming back to the hospital over and over and over again because of infection. I'm just going to use the rolly thing. So about 15 to 20 percent of patient deaths, 15 to 20 percent of, of dialysis patient deaths are from dialysis access infection. This is only second to cardiac morbidity and mortality. And infection is the leading cause of, uh, of catheter failure and also uh, grafting failure, right? The uh, National Kidney Foundation has sort of got these guidelines, and they want less than 1% infection rate for fistulas and less than 10% for grafts. Now, in an ideal world, that would be great, but you see later on, we're nowhere close to that. Why do people get infections? Because you basically go to some nasty you know, strip mall and go to a dialysis center, and some nurse pokes your arm three times a week with two big, giant needles. Uh, and you know, despite sterile technique, you still get introduced uh, bacteria into the into the uh, access site. Uh, aseptic technique, clearly you want to make sure it's clean, you use antiseptic technique, you wear sterile gloves, but I just don't think that happens routinely. Uh, and so the infection starts at the access site. You introduce bacteria into the access site. The most common pathogen is Staph aureus. Staph epidermis is, is also up there, and then a bunch of other things that people get. Now, if they've got other infections going on, that's, an, that's an, a cause also, right? So as I mentioned before, infection is only second to thrombosis as the cause of graft loss. And again, as you sort of get to take care of these patients, you run out of access sites, and the more times you have an access site fail and you have to revise it, the fewer, fewer places there are to put the next one in, right? So you look at the Canadian, Canadian study, looked at, at access site infections and four and a half percent rate for AV fistulas. So we want less than one, and it's we're somewhere about four to five. We want less than 10 for grafts. It's more realistically about 20 percent. Other, other studies have shown the same thing. So we're probably five times off for, in fact, for, cat, for fistulas and, uh, you know, more than double the rate for grafts. Long way to go. Uh, etiology, again, all these things that make this patient population difficult to manage, but Indwelling catheters increase your risk of, of infection. Previous bacteremia, previous grafts, and most all of these patients have had previous grafts. Um, complications. So not only does the graft get infected and you have to deal with that, but at least other infections like endocarditis, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis. So the infection, they be basically become bacteremic. You have an indwelling you know, foreign body that is a source of infection and leads to other complications. 
Uh, if you have Staph aureus, it's much higher risk of getting infection, one of those other sort of metastatic infections. Uh, about 20, more than 20% of people who have Staph aureus will get osteoseptic arthritis, endocarditis, and die. Um, and if you have gram-positive bacteremia, it's almost 40%. Indwelling catheters, as, as Claudia Shahan says, increase the risk uh, of um, graft infection uh, by, or in, by so about a 50% chance of infection versus 33% with a native AV fistula. So, what is, so now you got a patient comes in, they've got infection, what do you deal with? So you want to get rid of the infection. Uh, so you want to ex either can excise the graft. So ideally, you take the whole graft out and you reconstruct the artery and vein with patch angioplasty. That's a lot of work and, and probably not. Uh, although probably the gold standard, sometimes just not realistic or not necessary. Subtotal graft excision, um, you can just take out the infected part if it's localized. You know, they come in and the whole graft's floating in pus, and obviously you've got to take the whole thing out. But if it's just a sort of small area, pseudoaneurysm or something, you can excise that segment. Uh, I was just at a, talk at a conference last week, and a guy who does you know, thousands of these a year, what he'll do is actually light, go back to where the, where the grafts well incorporate, co incorporated, ligate it, oversew it, let the area sort of heal up, go back, thrombectomize the graft that was there and put a little interposition graft in. Uh, so there are some options. And partial excision with segmental bypass, depending on, and sometimes you can use these early access grafts um, that you can just stick so you don't have to put a catheter in, you just replace it and then replace a segment and they can go back again to dialysis through the graft right away. Um, uh, sort of basically what we talked about. Uh, if you do have infection that goes all the way back to the arterial anastomosis, then I would recommend taking the whole thing out, right? Because if you leave a little, uh, it's not an uncommon thing. We had this last week, a week, couple weeks ago, I was on call. Patient had a graft excision a couple of times uh, and kept bleeding. And uh, we went back in and they sort of excised the graft, but left that little uh, you've probably all seen this, like almost like a little volcano where the anastomosis is, and this is this nice sort of erupting volcano coming out of the artery because they've taken a little bovine pericardium and sewed it onto that segment. Well, the pericardium had just basically been spit off, and you have this thrombus sitting in the top of this uh, artery where the anastomosis used to be. You've got to excise that epithelialized segment of the artery and get back to healthy artery. Uh, so we had an interposition graft at that site. Uh, so that's a pretty common sight, right? Big abscess overlying a graft. You stick a needle, your know, scalpel in, pus pours out, and it's very rewarding. But you got to take care of the underlying problem, right? Antibiotics, surgical debridement is all good stuff. Antibiotics alone will not treat PTFE graft infection. So you know, you go see these patients. They're on the medicine service. You got a consult. They got a fever, a white count. Their arms red and hot, and they've been on Vanco for five days in the hospital. You got it. Graft's got to come out. Doesn't matter how many. You know, scans, you get white blood cell scans, take the graft out. And sometimes it has to do that. So it's a little disfiguring. It's a relatively morbid operation. You've got to get all the plastic out, get back to the artery, get rid of it all. Um, HIV, um, so it's sort of a special comment on HIV. Patients with HIV should not get PTFE grafts. They will essentially all get infected. I would go over this, but I can't read it from here. So. Um, it's in the talk, but basically I'm, the point is have a plan, right? Have a protocol that you follow, you know, uh, you know, sort of go through these things systematically. If you're sick, if the patient's bacteremic, treat them with antibiotics, get rid, of the, get rid of the infection process. If it's really focal, localized infection, you can probably deal with it locally, but uh, you've got to have a plan in place. And I think every, this, I think one of the, it's, um, it's, this is something that can be protocolized, right? You just have a protocol for how you manage them. Uh, so, you know, again, treat the, treat the infection, get rid of the infectious source, so the, the, uh, the graft has to come out. If you've got a vein fistula, you can obviously repair it, usually without having to abandon it. Uh, but PTFE is bad when it's infected. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, so one of the other complications, so you get infection and the other is aneurysms, and sort of not all aneurysms are infection, but infection is certainly an etiology for aneurysm. So what causes an aneurysm? High pressure, maybe. It's not really a pressure thing. It's probably high flow, hemodynamics within the fistula, uh, and then repetitive puncture in the wall, either in the graft or in the vein, causes weakness in the wall, and then you get these pseudoaneurysms. And, and, and aneurysms are different, probably, 
uh, and we'll talk about megafistulas a little bit. But pseudoaneurysms are just from repeated puncture. Uh, bleeding comes then from the high pressure, uh, certainly infections in etiology for all of this stuff, and then probably just poor technique, right? If you, if the, you know, we get sort of this one or two dialysis centers send all the bad complications because they got the not good nursing staff, right? Um, so an aneurysm can rupture and bleed. Uh, the bleeding itself causes a hematoma that sometimes becomes the pseudoaneurysm. Uh, if a normal fistula bleeds a lot, then you probably have to worry, worry about a central vein problem and deal with that. Uh, overlying skin problem, if you get that sort of clot or scab over a, a fistula, that's a, a, an impending problem, so deal with it soon. And what's the etiology of a, a pseudoaneurysm or aneurysm? Uh, well, if it's, if it's infection, then they'll be hot and red and tender, and sometimes they'll be draining a little bit of blood, a little bit of pus, and you've got this big mass. It's probably infected pseudoaneurysm, right? Uh, more commonly, those pseudoaneurysms are segmental from multiple puncture sites. Uh, the, the hole is actually relatively small, so it's not that big a deal to fix them. Now, uh, if you work at a place where there's a busy interventional nephrology practice or interventional radiology practice, then every one of those things is, a, is an opportunity for them to put a covered stent in, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so, you know, that buttonhole technique, people like to do this because they, you know, they get incense, they, they become insensate at the puncture site, so you just get repeated cannulation at the same spot. Well, you know, you take a 20, 18 gauge needle, 20 gauge needle, and keep puncturing the same site over and over and over again, eventually it's going to break down. Uh, that's a PTFE graft they removed after, you know, a couple, couple years of being uh, skewered with a, with, a, with a dialysis needle, right? Um, again, pseudoaneurysms, everyone here knows what a pseudoaneurysm is, it's not a real aneurysm, it's not a dilate, it's a partial, it's basically, it's a hole with a hematoma, the hematoma becomes incorporated, uh, it can cause graft thrombosis, pain, infection, bleeding. Uh, that does not mean it's infection, but certainly it could be associated with infection and happens in up to 10% um, in PTFE grafts. That's a pretty classic ultrasound result, you would be very happy to see. So, you know, narrow neck, big, big bulge, flow within the pseudoaneurysm. Uh, you can see that right here. Uh, PTFE graft's usually intact, except for a small hole. Um, that's a bigger one. And again, so they've got a Laplace's law, and we want to talk about that. It's back to physics, but again, as it gets bigger, the pressure inside the pseudoaneurysm gets higher, and the thing gets, continues to grow. This is one of those, you know, impending ruptures, or a patient comes in, they've had intermittent bleeding, somebody's put a pressure dressing on them, they show up in the ER, uh, you probably want to get that schedule to be fixed sooner than later, right? Um, I think that's the same stuff. So here's a pretty classic, you know, bulging pseudoaneurysm, lots of thrombus. Uh, oh, and look, right, there's your PTFE graft inside your fistula that's got a massive hole in it. So, you know, ideally you'd resect that whole thing. I think if, if you have a pseudoaneurysm like that, uh, you've got to assume the graft's infected, so we would just excise the graft, mobilize that vein. It probably can just be primarily just sewn back together. Um, kind of some of the principles you want to, ex uh, well, I like to use a tourniquet because I don't, you know, you can't always get proximal and distal control. So you just, you know, put a tourniquet up high in the upper arm if you've got room, exsanguinate the arm, blow up the, uh, blow up the tourniquet. Now you've got a very, you got a bloodless field, you can make a small ellipse. Uh, there's a pseudoaneurysm right there. You mobilize the vein, you excise the, the bad part, primarily repair the vein, and you can go back to using the fistula within a, in a day or two. Let's get rid of that. So endografts, I think, you know, sort of easy, right? This makes, it makes sense. There's an aneurysm, we put a stent graft in. We all love to put stent grafts in aneurysms, but uh, we don't always then go and stick a needle through the stent graft multiple times a, a week uh, right after we put it in. So I think uh, while they look good and they can make the fistula work nicely, at least on, a, on, a, on an imaging study, they don't work. They have a high rate of failure, so primary patency at six months is only 30%. Uh, you know, my, they can resolve the pseudoaneurysm, but you're always going to have that thrombus there, and they're very difficult to keep sticking through. Now, um, again, main, fistula maintenance is a full-time business, I and mean, you can literally just open up a lab and do fistula maintenance, and you'll end up putting in a bunch of stent grafts, but I think you've got to be cautious because they, there's one right there. So that look probably had a little pseudoaneurysm. It was super easy to put a graft in and now your skin's eroded and now you can see your graft through the skin. And so that needs to come out. Um, and that's much more difficult to do than if you would have just 
primarily primarily repaired that pseudoaneurysm. This is a giant aneurysm or mega fistula. So this is different. This isn't the pseudoaneurysm. This is the entire vein. As this has probably been in that patient for five or six or eight years. Uh, it looks like it's got a small boa constrictor underneath the skin. Um, and this can, these can grow and probably are always related to central vein stenosis. So before you go meddling with trying to fix that, you probably need to do a venogram and deal with the central vein stenosis. Um, you often find that. Um, my old partner would then take your first rib out um, and balloon that, but and that's a little bit controversial. But you know, I do think there's some um, underlying extrinsic compression as well as the, the high flow. And certainly, if there's been multiple previous indwelling catheters at that site, there's a big fibrin sheath. So I do think you probably you would need to deal with that first because otherwise you're going to have your fistula fail. Uh, and so this is a sort of mega fist, it's not as big as that other one, but we, you know, our approach has been to sort of mobilize it completely. Um, you can use a bougie, so put a 20 French bougie, or you can use a, a balloon, you can go percutaneously, put a long balloon in, and then placate the fistula, and uh, just close up the skin. I like to mobilize a little bit of a flap and put the repaired vein not directly under your suture line, because when your suture line fails, on the skin, then your suture line fails on your fistula. And it's a vein, but it's arterialized, so the bleeding is significant. Uh, and then sort of you can see here is the suture line, and here's the fistula in a new plane, and uh, can be, you know, certainly much more aesthetically better, but also functionally better. Uh, this is another, this is another mega fistula, completely mobilized. And I think in this scenario, um, I, what I think you'd do is just mobilize that completely, and if you do that, you'll find you have so much extra length, you can just resect the dilated part uh, and sew it back together. But another alternative is to, um, again, over the bougie or, or over some, over a balloon, and then just use a vasco stapler and take all that excess um, dilated venous tissue off. And again, you have a nice new fistula, create a new tunnel underneath the skin flap, close the tissue up, uh, and now you got a nice, still large, but much less um, snake-like than the last one. Uh, this is sort of published stuff from before, a few years ago. Uh, 35 patients with megafistulas, 86% 80, salvage rate, and again, much better if you create a new skin flap. Again, so there's no you know, guidelines, no three centimeters you have to fix these things. I think if there's skin breakdown, you should fix them. If they're, inter if they're interfering with function, you should fix them. And if it's steel or, um, or just becomes difficult for the, for the access site, uh, you kind of want to maintain the fistula, but you don't want to uh, thrombose the fistula. But you can rehabilitate these mega fistulas. Pseudoaneurysms, I think, should be dealt with only if they're symptomatic. Uh, otherwise, you just potentially risk infecting the graft, right? So that's all I got. That's all I know. Uh, have a great, enjoy the rest of your time. And